So we've just heard that the vast majority of people either are using the cloud or are thinking of moving to the cloud. Now the first thing that usually happens when you get a new service on the internet is you get a new set of credentials, okay? Another login, username and password. How many people in this room have got more than 50 usernames and passwords? Yeah, okay? That is a major security problem because typically users will use weak passwords or they'll use the same passwords in different places. Corporate networks, on the other hand, will be usually more strongly protected. To log into your corporate network, you may have two-factor authentication, you may have a dongle or, or anything else, you might use your mobile phone. They tend to protect their networks more strongly. So what we, what we say is, well, if you're moving to the cloud, why shouldn't you log in to your corporate network, first of all, and then move from there to the cloud and use the cloud as a service using your existing credentials? It makes sense, it makes it more secure, it means that you can start to reduce the numbers of usernames and passwords that you have, okay? So what we did was we looked at how we can do this and because most of the suppliers currently are proprietary, we didn't want to add it to a proprietary system, we wanted to add it to an open source system. Now OpenStack is an open source cloud software supplier. You can download the software from the internet, you can run your own cloud service based on OpenStack. There are actually public services based on OpenStack as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to probably, guessing, I would say it will become the Apache of cloud services. So Apache today is the web service that people use for their, for their web servers. It's the most, and it's open source. And I'm, I'm suggesting that OpenStack will become the same for cloud eventually. It will be the open source software that people download and use when they want to, 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 to run cloud services. So that's why we decided we would add federation to, to OpenStack. Okay, so what is identity? It's, it's, it's all about identity management. What is identity? It's actually a set of attributes that uniquely characterize you. And based on your identity, we want to give you access to the cloud. So people with different identities will get different privileges on the cloud. So it's not just a username and password, but it's a whole bunch of things that make up your identity. And we call these attributes, and you, you, your employer is an attribute, your qualification is an attribute, your age is an attribute, etc. Your role in the organization is attribute. In fact, your role in the organization is probably one of the key things that will be used to authorize you for access to the cloud because people with different roles will have different privileges. So identity should not be confused with the identifier. Identifier is usually a unique ID which uniquely identifies you and we're not talking about that specific. We're talking about a whole bunch of things that can be used to identify you and authorize you. But in the, old, in the olden days, people used the identifier to do both things. You would log in with your identifier, which was your username, and it would be then held in an access control list to give you access rights. So the identifier was all that was used, and that was, it's really too restrictive, especially when you're thinking about systems for thousands or millions of users uh, to, to give everybody unique identifiers, and then have to have access control lists based on, on unique identifiers. Where does your identity come from? It actually comes from an authority that gives you the attribute. Now, the authority might be yourself. You might actually assert your own attributes, but typically your attributes come from authorities who say what attributes you've got. In this environment, we'll be talking about your employer. Your employer would be the authority that would say which attributes you have, your roles in the organization, which department you work for, uh, and various things like that, which would then authorize you to use, to use the cloud. And what the authority does is after you've logged in to the identifier, your authority makes an assertion to the cloud provider about your attributes. And those attributes are then used to authorize you to access the cloud. So you log into your identity provider, which is your own organization. It then makes some attribute assertion about you to the cloud provider, which will then give you access based on it. And it usually sends the assertion as a digitally signed uh, piece of information across the internet so that it can't be tampered with. Uh, and we would call that maybe an attribute certificate or an authorization credential. And the identity provider is, is, this org is your organization that would do this. So what is federated identity management? Then it's a group of organizations that set up trust relationships in order 
to share information and users between themselves. So there'll be the cloud provider, there'll be your organization, there'll be another organization. They will trust each other to make these assertions about their users, and then based on the assertions, the recipient will say, okay, I trust the asserter, I believe that the user has these attributes, he's, he's a role in this organization, based on this assertion, I will give him access to the cloud resource. So that's basically what we're talking about, setting up a federation of service providers who trust each other to receive and send assertions between themselves and based on that to give users access to the resources. So how does it work? So in the bottom right hand corner we've got your organization, the identity provider. In the top corner we've got the cloud provider and there's this trust relationship that's been set up between them. That's done in the background before you as a user come along. So they've they already set up their contractual arrangements, they've got their trust relationship, they know the format of the statements are going to be sent from one another. So you go to the cloud provider and say, I want to access you, and the cloud provider says, well, I don't actually want a username and password from you anymore, that's the old way of doing things, I want you to go and log in back at your own home organization, I want you to use whatever mechanism they use, Kerberos, two-factor authentication, secure ID cards, username, password, whatever they use, they will authenticate you using your existing credentials. And then, after you've authenticated, they will send an assertion back to the cloud provider to say, we have authenticated this user, we know who he is, believe us, trust us, we've got a trust relationship, and I'm telling you, this guy is a project manager for this project, he's got this role, he works in this department, whatever, and then the cloud provider can use that to authorize you to access the particular services and the particular parts of the services that are available. So different people from your organization would get access to different parts of the cloud, cloud service because they would have different attributes asserted by the identity provider. And of course, you can then build this model up, bring, bring your partners in. So you can build whole federations with, for example, in the UK, we now have a federation of all universities. There's a thousand, there's more than a thousand service providers and identifiers who are all federated together. So I now, from my university account, can log into hundreds of services that have been provided to me by the university. And everybody, all universities can do it. And this has been rolled out to schools. So schools are also now becoming federated um, so that schools can also join this, this same system and use their existing credentials to access more services. So it's, it's, it's growing very big. Okay. The government is now rolling this out. The government is wanting to offer government services to users so that when you do online, maybe online inland revenue, fill in your financial uh, accounts at the end of the year or whatever, they're moving their service to online and they have just appointed eight identity providers. These are the ones they've currently contracted with to provide the identity provision for, they're hoping, 25 million people in the UK. So they're expecting that 25 million people in the UK will get credentials with these identity providers and then we'll be able to go and access various different government services, initially started by the Department of Work and Pensions, but will be rolled out to the DVLA, to Inland Revenue, etc. And then from the, these one set of credentials, you'll be able to log into all the different government services. So that's something that the, that the Cabinet Office is currently organising and, and running with DWP. Everybody's heard of a number of those. You've all heard of PayPal, you've all heard of the post office, you've all heard of Experian, I guess, and, and probably Verizon. Some of the others are a little bit less well known, but, but nevertheless, they're all part of the, uh, of the agreements with the government. So why do we do it? Well, we said it makes it easier for users, less credentials to remember, okay? You only need one set, and you can then log on to different, different systems. Makes it easier for system developers, because now, when I develop my cloud application, I don't have to worry about storing usernames and passwords. I'm no longer a honeypot for people to attack me because I'm not storing that information anymore. I'm allowing the identity provider to, start to do that for me. And, and they're doing it already. You're already having credentials to log in. So, so um, it makes it easier for, this, for the cloud providers to say, forget that, I don't, it's just, I don't need to worry about it. Okay, it provides more flexibility because it allows the authentication which is done between you and your organization to be rolled out and, and built stronger without affecting the cloud service. And it will then give you stronger 
authentication for a number of services, and the services can rely on what your identity provider does. So it gives that flexibility in terms of rolling out new, uh, new mechanisms as they, as they become available for authentication. And it makes it more secure because users no longer need to remember lots of passwords and they can actually have two-factor authentication and, and other things like that. So it, it's, there's a, a number of reasons and benefits for actually uh, in, introducing federated identity management. And of course, it makes it easier for the cloud provider because the number one issue is often managing users who've lost their passwords. And, and you no longer need to do that as a cloud provider because the identity provider is, is doing that. So, using FIM then, we can use our existing login credentials and we log into the cloud via our identity provider. So, let's, let's um, look at OpenStack then. So, OpenStack, we said, is an open source cloud service. Now, OpenStack already has an identity service built into it. It's called Keystone. So, it has a number of cloud services and they've built an identity service in it. However, they made the mistake when they built the identity service in it of requiring everybody to register a new set of credentials with the identity service. So, so they, they, built, they did it so that you can use a multiple set of cloud services, but you only need one set of credentials. You don't need to have a credentials for each of the cloud services. You only need one set provided by Keystone. But we said, let's go a step further. Let's not put the credentials in Keystone, let's put them back in our own organization. So we modify Keystone, which is the identity provider, to actually get the, get the credentials in from the, the organization, uh, the assertions, validate the assertions, and then send the user onto the cloud service. And the cloud service can continue as it was before because it's now getting the assertion from Keystone, uh, which, which says that the user's okay. So Keystone's the, the, the OpenStack identity service, and it bases, it bases today on the things called tenants, roles, and domains. So um, tenants are, are the, if you like, the account that you're logged into. The role is the role you have that gives you different privileges. And there are different domains, okay, um, for, for um, different users of the, cloud, of the cloud service. And of course, it's stored usernames and passwords as well uh, for, for authentication. Users log into Keystone, and then they're redirected. So this is how it's working, how it's working today. Um, and the service asks Keystone to validate the token and then grant, grants them access based on role-based access control model. So what we've done is we no longer store the username and password information in Keystone. In fact, we don't store any of the information in Keystone. The users log in via their own organization. Their organization sends the assertion to Keystone and Keystone validates the assertion and then maps the user into the uh, roles and tenants. So what you do now as a cloud administrator is you just put some mapping rules in. You just say when users come in with these identity attributes, map them into what previously were the tenants and roles and projects. Then those tenants, roles and projects get sent to the service provider and they get the, they get the same access as they had before. So this is a, um, a demonstration. I'm not doing a live demonstration. It's just a screen, screen capture of, of how it works today. This is using the, the standard uh, software that you download from OpenStack. They, they provide, at the moment, they provide um, command line uh, clients. Okay? It's, not, it's not a web-based client, but we're, we're working on web-based clients as well um, as part of our student projects. But the, what, the standard software gives you a, a command line client. So this is a command line client for accessing the service called Swift. Swift is the cloud file storage service, okay? So the user typically logs in uh, saying, I want to go to Swift, um, and uh, the Persistence Kent is the name of the Federation uh, Keystone service, um, and he says, I want to list the text files. That's the, the command at the end. Now we've added a new minus F option. We, instead of putting your username and password in that command, you say minus F. I want to do federated login. I don't want to send you my username and password. I want to use federated login. So Keystone says back to the user, OK, you want to do federated login. I've got two identity providers that are registered with me. There's the Kent proxy identity service and there's Big Bank. Who do you work for? Which one do you want to log in with? And you enter the number you want to log in with. In this case, we chose Big Bank. You get redirected to Big Bank. Big Bank brings up its uh, web browser screen. You type in your credentials to Big Bank. You log into Big Bank. And then you go back, and you're now back into Keystone. And it's saying, OK, I've got the credentials from Big Bank. I know your attributes. 
And I know you're now entitled to use the following tenants. In this case, there's only one tenant to choose from, but it's saying, I know the tenants that your attributes have been mapped into. Choose the tenant you want to use. Well, I want to use the visa service from Big Bank. So I choose the visa service, and it comes back, and it says you've got the following files. You've got the August, the July, September uh, files uh, that are available. And then you can actually say, well, well, well list the contents, etc. So that's just a demonstration of how we built it. And so it becomes very easy for users. OK, and that, that is the the end of the talk, and I think the questions are going to be at the end, aren't they? Yes.